Hello and welcome to today's ADAA professional webinar, Deep Brain Stimulation for Treatment Resistant Depression. I'd like to welcome our presenter, Dr. Samir Sheth. Dr. Samir Sheth is currently Associate Professor, Cullen Foundation Endowed Chair, Vice Chair of Research and McNair Scholar in the Department of Neurosurgery, Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. He holds joint appointments in the Department of Neuroscience and the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Baylor. Dr. Sheth specializes in the treatment of patients with movement disorders, epilepsy, and psych psychiatric disorders. His research interests are centered on a desire to better understand brain function and develop new therapies for neuropsychiatric conditions. Thank you so much for joining us today. Dr. Sheth, thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, and thank you for this opportunity. Allow me to share my slides. My name is Samir Sheth, and I'm very happy to talk to you today about deep brain stimulation for treatment resistant depression. This is a topic that um, is uh, very near and dear to my heart, and I'm, I'm very happy to share it with you, and thank you for your attention. A few disclosures, uh, the consulting agreements are not really relevant, uh, nor is the fellowship funding. Um, funding from uh, NIH, that first one in bold, uh, I will be talking about uh, in the latter part of this talk. Uh, and deep brain stimulation for depression is off label in the United States. And so this is investigational. I'll start with some propositions I'd like to discuss with you all. Um, the first and really most important is that mental health disorders affect brain networks and therefore they demand network minded therapy. There's no single spot in the brain that is the locus for depression or OCD or any other. Uh, psychiatric or mental health disorder. And I think that future efforts in neuromodulation, certainly surgical neuromodulation, will rely on improved methods of identifying and engaging these networks in a disorder-specific and individual-specific way in order to really optimize therapy. Uh, this is a brief outline. I'll, I'll talk first um, about the historical background of DBS for treatment-resistant depression to get us all on the same page. Uh, then I'll talk about depression networks, uh, and this discussion will kind of motivate um, the last part of the talk, which is on future efforts to optimize and individualize DBS for depression using this network-based understanding. Uh, so first, uh, as a background, uh, DBS for depression has been around for many years. Uh, as I said, it is investigational uh, in, the, in the United States. There are several targets undergoing active investigation, the ventral capsule ventral striatum, the subcolossal cingulate or area 25, the superlateral branch, the medial forebrain bundle, uh, and other uh, associated uh, nomenclature for this target, lateral habenula, and many others. I'm going to focus on the first two, the ventral capsule ventral striatum target and the subcloacal or subgenual cingulate. The VCVS target uh, has been under investigation for a number of years. This is uh, the first and, and seminal publication from Don Malone and colleagues uh, in uh, 2009 of uh, 15 patients in this open label series from three sites, Cleveland Clinic, Brown, Mass General. Uh, these are patients with chronic and treatment resistant depression. They must have tried of course, non-surgical therapy, including a number of medication trials uh, and uh, behavioral therapy, uh, and oftentimes electroconvulsive therapy, uh, which of course is definitely a requirement for, for trials these days. And the results are summarized quickly here. I'll just point you to um, the, the, uh, the figure in the lower right uh, showing improvement in uh, both the Madras and Hamilton scores over time, over months. Uh, and basically the, uh, the response rate, which was defined as a 50% reduction in the symptom score was 40% to six months, and just over half at 53% at last follow-up. Uh, so quite a significant response in these patients who are otherwise quite resistant. A remission rate of 20% at six months and 40% uh, at last follow-up. Some uh, adverse events of hypomania, which is definitely uh, an adverse event associated with this target. Uh, those promising results led to a double-blind, sham-controlled, randomized clinical trial that was industry-sponsored called RECLAIM. The plan was to enroll 208 patients based on their power analysis. Um, this was done at the five sites shown here. Uh, there was a, a, an interim analysis that was unplanned at, after 30 patients were enrolled. And I'll talk to you about that in a minute. The design is shown here. The implant was done and then about a month later, patients were randomized to 16 weeks of uh, either active stimulation or sham stimulation, followed by an open label optimization, or, sorry, an open label period at the end. Uh, and these are the results. The, the sham response rate was two out of 14 or 14%. Uh, this was not unexpected, but the active response rate was only 20%. Uh, and this was unexpectedly low 
And this was done at this um, interim analysis that was not initially planned, but done after 30 patients were involved or enrolled. Um, the difference between the active and sham was not significant, but of course there was not uh, planned power to detect that difference. Uh, and the open label results are shown here also quite modest. Uh, considerations about this trial, as I mentioned, it was not powered to see a difference at just 30 patients. And perhaps uh, that four month, 16 week period of time was insufficient to really be able to see uh, a difference in response between active and sham stimulation. As well, the amount of exploration of the stimulation parameter space was quite limited during that double blind, that randomized uh, phase. They uh, essentially used parameters you know, borrowed from the movement disorders literature. It's unclear whether for any individual patient, those parameters would be optimal. Lessons learned from this trial, uh, should that double-blinded phase be longer? Should we allow more time for active versus sham to separate? Should the structure be different? Uh, should patients be uh, randomized right away to active versus sham? Do we know enough what stimulation parameters uh, engage the appropriate networks to treat patients uh, on an individual basis such that we can go right away to uh, a randomized format uh, uh, right after implant? And what about the, the variability in anatomy and in, front, and in function uh, that is now understood and, and appreciated to be quite important uh, for individualized targeting? That was not used in this trial and perhaps that would have uh, changed the outcome. Interestingly, right around the same time, uh, published uh, uh, around the same year, was this trial from the Dutch group um, with uh, Damian Danis as the uh, psychiatrist, Rick Sherman as the neurosurgeon. Um, 25 patients also, um, open label initially, but with a very different design where after implant of the device, they underwent about a year of optimization, open label optimization, exploring different stimulation parameters to identify those that may be optimal for each individual patient. Again, with the understanding that we don't necessarily know what that is yet uh, for this target and for this uh, indication. After that optimization, they were randomized in a crossover fashion to on versus off stimulation to uh, provide some information about actual efficacy. The results shown here were quite different than Reclaim. Um, after the op open label optimization, 40% of patients responded, again, with a 50% reduction in score. Uh, and during the double blind crossover phase, there was a 56% responder rate. And this is shown here. The higher scores, of course, are worse symptoms. So during sham stimulation, the scores are higher. During active stimulation, they are lower. Uh, and this was a significant difference. So this trial, as opposed to the Reclaim trial, even though the target in the brain was the same, um, provided a very different and higher level of evidence, uh, perhaps because of the different trial design, this open label optimization al allowed stimulation parameter exploration, allowed individualization of that uh, stimulation delivery. Uh, and this delayed uh, crossover phase after the, uh, the op optimization allowed distinction of active effect from sham or placebo effect. So I'll switch gears here and talk about the other target, the subcolosal or subgenual cingulate. Um, this uh, trial, I'm uh, sorry, this, this uh, target uh, was really focused on uh, after the results of some uh, neuroimaging work from Helen Mayberg and colleagues in the late 1990s. They did some uh, O15 labeled water PET studies and showed that this part of the brain, this uh, subcolosal area of the brain, uh, had different blood flow depending upon whether uh, patients uh, were depressed or were uh, healthy volunteers. Uh, they, along with uh, Andres Lozano, the neurosurgeon at Toronto, uh, implanted electrodes in this region in this uh, initial uh, pilot study in six patients in an open label fashion, a responder rate in four out of six patients, and PET studies showing um, normalization or, or um, change in that blood flow pattern reflecting uh, improvement in symptoms. The continuation study in another 14 patients, total of 20 is shown here, published by Lozano and colleagues in 2008. Uh, re responder rate uh, of 60% is six months, again, taking the same uh, treatment refractory type of population with an almost 50%, uh, 48% uh, reduction in their Hamilton scores. Uh, further open label work was done then by the Emory group with uh, Bob Gross and Helen Mayberg, as well as, as this uh, multi-center uh, Canadian study. Uh, results varied, a 92% responder rate uh, in the, uh, the Emory study, a 29% responder rate in the, in the Canadian study. Uh, so some variability, but overall uh, enough uh, optimism to lead to this industry-sponsored uh, sham-controlled randomized double-blinded uh, trial known as Broaden. Uh, planned enrollment was, again, uh, just over 200, similar to Reclaim. Uh, here there was a planned interim analysis um, after about half or 90 patients were enrolled. Uh, 
Uh, the design is shown here, similar to reclaim. Soon after uh, the implant, patients were uh, randomized to active versus sham stimulation in a, a double-blinded fashion. Uh, and again, strict um, restrictions of programming parameters during that double-blinded uh, randomized phase. Uh, the results here uh, in the double-blind phase are uh, unfortunately much like reclaim in that there was a sham response rate of 17%, compare that to 14% in reclaim, very similar and expected. Again, the active response rate, only 20%, also very similar to reclaim, but much below expectations based on the open label trials that preceded Broaden. Um, there was a planned futility analysis that was performed at this point, again, after 90 were enrolled. Uh, and the, uh, the, the futility analysis showed a 17% chance of seeing active versus sham uh, separation if the trial were continued. The predetermined cutoff for dis discontinuation was less than 10%. Uh, so if that uh, futility analysis showed less than 10% chance, the plan was to stop the study. It was not less than 10, it was, it was 17, uh, but uh, nonetheless, the sponsor did decide to discontinue the study. Interestingly, the open label follow-up did show uh, improved response in, in about half of patients. Interestingly, during the time of Rodin, um, there were advances being made in terms of how to do the DBS targeting and how to individualize that targeting to specific patients using white matter imaging and, and diffuser, diffuser tensor imaging tractography. The story really was that um, if you just looked at responders and non-responders, there's quite a lot of overlap uh, between those recording sites. If you just looked anatomically or at stereotactic coordinates, this is a paper by Clement Hamani and colleagues in 2009. On the other hand, if you look at the white matter connectivity, you look at the difference in connectivity profile between responders and non-responders, an interesting story emerges, which is that responders have a particular pattern of connectivity that non-responders do not have. Uh, and so then the idea was that perhaps if the targeting were refined such that uh, the target were, were placed in a specific white matter uh, confluence that uh, results may be improved. And indeed, uh, as uh, Rupert Passe and colleagues showed in their papers in 2017 and 2020, that is indeed the case, even in a prospective fashion. Uh, this evolution in targeting and individualization based on networks and, and white matter connectivity was not in included in, in Broaden because the trial parameters were set uh, before these findings were really uh, well known. So lessons learned from all of these studies uh, in VCVS and in subclosal cingulate, some patients clearly improved. When, uh, when, when batteries ran out uh, of, um, of energy in an unknown or uh, unpredicted way, patients definitely worsened. This is essentially a, a triple blind study um, uh, in terms of a you know, discontinuity of care. So some patients definitely improved. Responses were certainly heterogeneous though. Uh, and one thing that really characterized both of the pivotal trials that were uh, stopped and uh, unsuccessful was that parameter exploration was very much limited. Uh, and so the question really remains as to how to individualize and optimize engagement of a brain network on an individual patient basis. Okay, so this brings us to uh, the middle uh, chunk of this talk, talking about networks uh, underlying depression and how we need to engage them and how we may be able to do so. So uh, if we just zoom out and think about this, you know, a network-based understanding of mental health disorders, we can come up with a few different concepts. First, as I mentioned in the very beginning, this, these disorders are disorders of brain networks, not of individual spots in the brain. As well, our classification based on symptoms is quite limited. For depression, for example, uh, there are several criteria. You need five out of nine criteria to be uh, classified as uh, having major depressive disorder. So you can have two patients with only one overlapping criterion uh, that are given the same label, the same diagnosis. And as we know, just from our own experience, depression can look very different from one patient to the next. Now, instead of using the symptom-based classification, what if we could orthogonalize uh, dysfunction onto axes that are defined neurobiologically uh, based on circuit dysfunction? Uh, doing so may actually provide uh, a, a, a a, a, a symptom domain-based way of classifying and therefore testing therapeutics, classifying the, the disorder and testing therapeutics as opposed to this symptom-based way, which is imprecise uh, and, uh, and hard to generalize. And finally, we have the tools to do this. Uh, so the idea is that the network under uh, underlying depression or you know, regulating mood, cognition, et cetera, may, re may be represented by this wagon wheel where many different cortical and subcortical areas are on the outside of this wheel. Uh, and these are all areas that are involved in depression. 
the challenge is to find a central hub-like area where if we deliver stimulation or energy into this central hub-like area, the effect of stimulation may be able to propagate along the connections between these areas, like along the spokes of this wheel to engage a much larger region uh, and so that we can uh, precisely target one region in the brain, but the influence of that uh, stimulation may engage a much wider network that can be therapeutic. So how do we understand, engage, identify these networks? Well, we can certainly use non-invasive brain imaging techniques. Uh, this is resting state fMRI. This is one of the uh, earlier papers from 2005 from uh, Dr. Raikel and colleagues uh, with Mike Fox that really started using resting state network, uh, resting state fMRI to uh, understand networks. The idea is that the brain is not doing all the same thing at the same time. Of course, there's different regions of the brain that are coordinated uh, and are uh, coordinating to uh, allow certain activities to occur. And we can use these fluctuations in the bold fMRI signal response to uh, identify these, these different brain regions. This occurs at rest. This also occurs during tasks. Again, we see that brain regions that are working together um, have this certain uh, profile with uh, bold fMRI so we can identify them. How do we use this for depression? Well, here's a monograph by Leanne Williams uh, at Stanford that proposes one way of doing this. Um, her proposal is that, uh, of course, we know that there are different networks identified by uh, bold resting state fMRI. For example, the default mode network engages these areas of the brain, the intermedial prefrontal cortex, pre uh, the posterior cingulate cortex, et cetera. The salience network includes the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, areas of the insula, et cetera. Other networks in, uh, in involve these other brain regions. It could be that these different networks form kind of a, a structural skeleton uh, upon which different types of depression may be manifest. So for example, uh, the rumination type of uh, depression uh, may uh, exist in and uh, preferentially engage areas within the default mode network, the anxious avoidance network, uh, sorry, type of depression, or by type of depression, may engage the salience network, et cetera. And so, these different biotypes of depression, rumination, anxious avoidance, cognitive discontrol, anhedonia, et cetera, may involve and engage these brain regions in a differential way. And we can use our understanding of these networks to study the differences between these depression biotypes. Okay, so now armed with this information, uh, where can we go from here? So I will first talk about a study that we are doing, and this is a NIH Brain Initiative funded study that involves uh, two clinical sites, um, us here at Baylor, uh, as well as the site at UT Southwestern in Dallas. Uh, uh, I'm the contact PI of this study and my co-PIs are Nader Paratian, the chair of neurosurgery at UT Southwestern and Wayne Goodman, chair of psychiatry here at Baylor. These are the two clinical sites. We have several other sites involved uh, in uh, some of the analysis and engineering, uh, the devices. Uh, Duke University with uh, Cameron McIntyre and his group are also involved in some uh, interesting imaging studies that I'll show you. So the idea for this study uh, and uh, that I'll talk about is to, to borrow what we know from another world, which is the epilepsy world. So uh, some of you may know in, in, in the world of epilepsy, it's very common that despite uh, a lot of uh, non-invasive tests, video EEG, MRI, PET, MEG, SPECT, uh, neuropsychological testing, WADA tests, et cetera, uh, we're unable to identify the seizure onset zone just from these non-invasive tests. And so it's very common worldwide to implant electrodes within the brain, uh, keep the patient in the epilepsy monitoring unit for days or a week or more uh, to identify where seizures are coming from and study that individual patient's epilepsy network. So this model of using intracranial recording and simulation to understand an individualized network, in this case, epilepsy, uh, is very common uh, to... Uh, to epilepsy surgery, but is almost not entirely used outside of the epilepsy world. So the question is, can we borrow this approach of intracranial recording stimulation to understand the network's underlying depression? As we do so, we are also using uh, DBS technology that has uh, segmented leads and steerable current, so we can orient the electrical field up and down the lead and circumferentially around the lead. And so with the DBS electrode just in one area, we can engage different networks by pointing the electrical field in different directions as shown in the image here. So this is what the implant looks like uh, for these patients in this trial. We have two types of uh, uh, electrodes that we're implanting. We have stereo EEG electrodes that are temporary and used for recording purposes mostly, and then DBS electrodes that are permanent and used for stimulating purposes. The DBS electrodes are placed in the two areas that I've spent the first half of the talk talking about, the subgenual cingulate, uh, 
and the VCVS that's done bilaterally. So there's four DBS leads. In this first surgery, we also implant approximately five uh, stereo EEG electrodes per hemisphere. And these are in, implanted in regions of the brain that we think are important in depression, that are uh, regions of the brain underlying the processing of emotions, cognition, decision-making, et cetera. Dorsolateral PFC, ventromedial PFC, medial and lateral orbitofrontal cortex, cingular cortex, uh, mesial temporal lobe, including amygdala. These are all regions, again, from uh, years and decades of non-invasive imaging and other studies we know are involved in depression. So this is what the overall trial design looks like. Uh, patients initially get implanted with the, um, uh, the electrodes I showed you previously, four DBS electrodes, 10 temporary stereo EEG electrodes. They stay in the hospital in the epilepsy monitoring unit for a period of 10 days. During this time, we do a number of studies to understand uh, these patients' networks on an individual basis and how they respond to stimulation. At the end of that monitoring phase, the SEG electrodes are removed. The DBS electrodes are internalized to pulse generators, and then the patient undergoes uh, an outpatient clinical trial where we start with eight months of open label optimization, where we use the information gained from the inpatient phase to inform the programming of the DBS device to narrow down the massive parameter space to just a few sets of simulation parameters that we think, based on the electrophysiological analyses, are going to be most relevant, most therapeutic. That's done in an open label fashion. And then like one of the studies I showed you earlier, we then withdraw the simulation uh, in a randomized double-blinded way to assess for efficacy. I'll just um, make a note as a sidebar that uh, the, the, the planning for how to put these four stimulating electrodes and 10 recording electrodes into the brain requires real uh, three-dimensional understanding, which is quite hard to do on our traditional surgical 2D uh, planning screen. So I'm going to show you a, a video of, uh, of what we're using, developed by Cameron McIntyre, shown here, who's now at Duke. This is an augmented reality uh, holographic system um, that allows us to really individualize and uh, visualize the DBS uh, sites as well as the uh, recording sites and the connections between them. So this is done, as I mentioned, in this holographic augmented reality system. You can see how we can do this in a real-time fashion. We can import the patient's imaging uh, on an individualized basis. And then in a very collaborative fashion, we can plan um, with this three-dimensional appreciation and we can move the electrodes, we can change the stimulation field models, and we can understand how all these different changes uh, influence uh, what regions of the brain are gonna be stimulated from, how they're gonna be recorded, and we can plan this implant in a three-dimensional way uh, in a very collaborative fashion. This, uh, this is how we did this for uh, the first patient in the trial who's now uh, two years into it. Uh, this was done in March of 2020. Uh, this is pre-pandemic, just pre-pandemic. Uh, and then now this is actually also a very pandemic friendly way of doing planning. This is uh, planning for the last couple of cases uh, done all uh, virtually and remotely. So uh, this is you know, top left, this is me in my home uh, with the augmented reality system. Uh, Nader Pratian, Kelly Bajanki, and others, uh, Cameron McIntyre, Angela, uh, all working you know, in their respective you know, homes or places of work uh, around the country. We can do this collaboratively, simultaneously with 3D audio, so we can talk to each other, uh, show each other what we're looking at, and really plan this implant in a three-dimensional way. This really revolutionized, I think, how uh, we were able to plan the surgery, and I think is going to be very important for uh, neurosurgery in general. So our first case uh, in this trial, as I mentioned, was done uh, in uh, March of uh, 2020, just prior to the pandemic. We identified a few goals that we had for the case. Two large goals. One is to measure the network state, uh, meaning the uh, electrophysiological and neural state in a few different uh, conditions, at baseline or at rest, as well as across a few different emotional states, uh, happy, sad, et cetera, um, using tasks to, uh, to uh, modify or, or uh, influence that emotional state, as well as during uh, various cognitive tasks. Secondly, we wanted to measure that network state in response to stimulation across a wide range of parameter space. I mentioned that the limitation of stimulation parameter space is one major limitation of some of those, uh, of, of those two large uh, pivotal trials. So we really wanted to broaden this parameter space and, and measure it quite uh, broadly and, and look at the network response to stimulation across that broad, that broad space. And finally, putting these two things together, how does um, 
the brain encode happy versus sad uh, to simplify it? And how does the brain respond to stimulation? If we put those two things together, we can then say, well, here's the state that we want. Here's how stimulation affects brain state. So we can then choose the stimulation parameters that are likely to produce the network response that leads to uh, the symptom response that we're trying to target. Uh, this is uh, just some pictures of that first case. Again, uh, quite a team that was assembled uh, to, to do so. A long surgery uh, and then nine days of experiments afterwards, lots of data generated, many experiments were conducted. 1,600 you know, or more parameter combinations were tried. Again, a massive team led to this effort uh, and were instrumental to getting it uh, to be successful. This uh, just shows a schematic of the implant. The, the DBS leads are shown here with the uh, cyan blue and kind of uh, pink contacts. And then all the other colored contacts represent the stereo EEG electrodes across the wide network. Again, sampling all of these different regions of the brain, cingulate cortex, amygdala, prefrontal cortex, uh, ventromesial, dorsolateral, et cetera. And so we have access to a wide range of these regions in uh, prefrontal and temporal regions. Um, visualizing and understanding these data is quite a challenge. You can imagine this is a video uh, done by Rice and Mathura, my uh, research coordinator. You, you can see how um, complex this is. So during, for example, left SCC stimulation, this is the pattern of activity evoked just in uh, high gamma, for example, uh, when we stimulate right SCC, with one particular uh, parameter combination, we get this other pattern. Here's left VCVS, creates yet a third pattern of activity across this network. And then finally, the right VCVS uh, with a certain parameter of stimulation produced this pattern of activity. Uh, these patterns um, are quite different for each stimulation uh, combination that is, uh, that is provided to the brain. And so it just creates a massive data set uh, and it's, uh, it's, high, it's high dimensional. And so uh, studying uh, these data and analyze them is, is quite a challenge. As well, we stimulated across, as I said, a, a wide range of frequency parameters, uh, pulse width, amplitudes, and contact configurations across a wide duration of stimulation from individual single pulses to one second stimulation, 15 second, and longer durations. Um, at, the, at the short frequency, at, at the short uh, durations of stimulation, we're able to uh, uh, test across a wide range of parameter space with longer duration of stimulation. Of course, that parameter space had to be reduced. We we're able to sample uh, quite a few combinations with this approach. And so now to really generate these electrophysiologically or network defined um, stimulation parameters, uh, we created this schematic to, to illustrate this complex problem. So the clinician, the programmer has control over the input stimulation parameters. So for example, the frequency, the pulse width, the amplitude, the direction, which lead you're using, et cetera. These are the parameters that we have control over as the clinicians, we, uh, you know, the, the, the typical way of doing this is that we, through a trial and error fashion, you know, use and employ some, some set of stimulation parameters, and then something complex happens in the brain that's difficult to understand, and then there's some behavior. The patient is improved or patient is not improved. Okay, and what's happening in the middle? Well, we don't know uh, in traditional DBS, but with, with this approach, with the intracranial recordings, we do have a window into what is happening within the brain. So we can understand and uh, calculate this network state, which is the spatial and spectral uh, changes occurring in the LFP at each of these contacts of which we have more than 150 throughout the frontal lobe and temporal lobe. Uh, and so now we can try to solve this complex problem by saying, okay, uh, here's the behavior that we would uh, like to target. Here's the network state associated with that behavior. And so now here are the input parameters that generate the network state that produces this desired behavior. There's many ways of doing this. Uh, our first attempt uh, in our first patient is, is shown here. And this is the work of, of Kelly Bajanki, who's faculty in our department, as well as her postdoc, Brian Metzger. So here's what they did. They said, okay, well, um, here's a desired state. Um, here's a desired um, uh, set of uh, uh, LFP features across this frontotemporal network. How do we define that? Um, there's a few ways of, of doing it, a few ways that we did it. Uh, the patient's um, uh, overall emotional cognitive state on, on day nine of his stay was, uh, was much better than it was before. And we, we defined this as the desired state. We also did it a couple other ways, uh, which we described in the paper. And then secondly, we said, okay, uh, for each stimulation uh, configuration, here's the pattern of activity produced by the brain. So here's the desired state. Here are many different states produced by uh, all the different stimulation parameters shown. And then we use this uh, iterative uh, general linear model to say, okay, 
which input parameter state produces a pattern that most closely resembles the desired state. Again, many ways of doing this, um, and uh, this is the, the one that we uh, implemented first. These are the simulation parameters that were generated based on that uh, modeling approach. All the numbers in blue represent things that are different from uh, uh, parameters defined just purely by behavioral testing and seeing you know, what made the patient acutely better or worse. Uh, that trial and error approach um, is, is fraught with concern because of the um, massive amount of stimulation space to explore and the unclear relationship between an acute response and long-term response. So this electrophysiologically defined response, uh, sorry, defined uh, set of stimulation parameters may be one way to uh, objectively do this. These are the results from our first patient. This was published uh, just a few months ago last year in 2021. Um, I'll call your attention to the, the blue line, which is the Hamilton depression inventory and the orange line, which is the Madras. The, um, uh, the yellow bar here is the week and a half uh, within the uh, uh, epilepsy monitoring unit, the inpatient phase. And then this pink bar is uh, the outpatient phase where we used the information gained from the inpatient phase to design just a few stimulation parameter uh, combinations to try. You know, we're not trying to massively explore the, the space. We did that in the 10 days in the hospital. And so this, uh, of course, shows the improvement over time. The uh, dashed line represents um, remission criteria, both for Madras in orange and Hamilton in blue. So by about four months um, uh, into the outpatient phase, the scores dropped to a point that was uh, in the remission category and continued to uh, decline. And this is all done open label. And then at this point, as I mentioned before, there was the double-blinded randomized withdrawal phase where we started to uh, reduce stimulation amplitude in a double-blind fashion the dark bar, dark blue bar here shows 100%. So there was a, a period of a couple of weeks where we did not make any change and there was no change here indicating a lack of any nocebo effect. And then again, in a blinded fashion, we started to incrementally reduce stimulation amplitude by 25% every week. Uh, the patient was unaware of this and the symptoms started worsening until they met escape criteria, uh, at which point we reinstated stimulation. Uh, now, uh, after breaking the blind in an open label fashion, the patient again got better. Um, so this... Um, Worsening of symptoms uh, during withdrawal in a, in a blinded, double blinded fashion uh, again speaks to the likely efficacy and, and distinguishment from any sham or placebo effect. Um, the, the top here again shows uh, that publication which came out last year. And I'll mention a related publication from the UCSF group uh, Catherine Skangos, the psychiatrist, Eddie Chang, the surgeon, as well as Phil Starr, the, the neurosurgeon at UCSF, is also published last year using a similar approach using um, stereo EG recordings in the brain to define targets in a slightly different uh, second part of that, where they used a responsive neurostimulation system to uh, record from and stimulate the, the brain chronically, and also with, with good response. So uh, I'll just summarize and wrap up here. Um, network disorders such as depression, OCD, many other um, psychiatric or mental health disorders demand a network-based therapy. Uh, we can't just focus on individual spots in the brain. We have to think of the brain as a network and how do we engage it effectively and on an individual specific basis. Intracranial recordings, as I've shown here and uh, other groups have also started to show, provide a unique perspective into this network activity uh, and the effect of stimulation on this network. And in the future, I really do think that individualization of both imaging and electrophysiological analyses will hopefully drive improved outcomes. Uh, I mentioned many members of the team along the way, uh, these, uh, these are pictures of more of the team. It's a massive effort here and uh, the other groups that are doing this kind of work. I really want to thank them because uh, they uh, are completely instrumental and just demonstrate how team science can be brought to psychiatric neuromodulation. With that, I will say thank you for your attention. I'll stop my share um, and uh, I'll say thank you once again.